If you do not catch up to him now, you may never find him again. Let's see. The gods have given me the souls that are forgiven. If you repent, you can join with them. Help me strike the final blow against Theos. Your defiance here is an illusion. You are a slave to the gods, bound to the rules, stuck in her system. Your continued existence is proof over the gods now. If you hadn't planted doubt in my mind long ago, I'd be living a normal life right now. Before I go, I will repay you for this curse now. Um, the gods have given me the souls that are forgiven. If you repent, you could join with them. I don't want to do any of this stuff to her. I'll waste no more time. Farewell, Eovara. Your soul deserves an end to its suffering. I'm sorry I wasn't able to grant it myself. May it come to you swiftly. If ever we should meet again, in this life or any other, I hope to find you at peace. Phew, all right. I see stairs, we're getting somewhere. So, it's true. The gods are a sham that people have followed for thousands of years. Know why I saved it twice there. A deer wants a chat. No, oh, he's gonna have to wait a minute. And I just knocked my mic over, Jesus Christ. Doesn't that just beat all? Here I was, wondering all this time whether all these terrible things were people's fault or the gods. Turns out they might be the same thing. Wonder how things would have gone different 15 years ago if the raid Sarens had been told their god was made in some forge or kiln someplace. Would we still have gone to war? People were starving, they'd have rebelled sooner or later. I could see the rebellion still happening, but I don't know that they would have invaded. He looks down at the ground, drumming his fingers against his side restlessly. When he speaks again, it seems half to himself. I don't know. When Woden left for war, we, uh, had a fight. As brothers will. What about? About him going off to war. He was set on it. My parents warned him. They said you get a new country with every trip across the border, but your god... You only get the one. For me, I didn't know who was right. All I knew was I didn't want him to go. It's the same for families as it is for gods. You only get the one. And I said every vicious thing I could think of, trying to change his mind. He brushed it off. Just got me madder, of course, him being so calm. He said I should come with him, but he'd understand if I didn't want to. Told him he'd better be able to face his god one day and answer for what he'd done. He said he'd keep that in mind. And then he was gone. By the time I had cooled off, months had passed. One morning it dawns on me that my brother always knew better than me. If he was so sure of what he was doing, then I should be there with him. I packed my things and was on the road that same morning. Of course, what I didn't know then was he'd already changed his mind. By that time, he was dead on that field. Do you think you went to Wildwind because of what you, you'd uh, said to him? Crossed my mind. You live in a place like Gilded Vale. You don't have a whole lot else to do other than think about things you don't want to think about. I hope that wasn't it. I hope he went there because it's what he thought was right. But it seems I'm not meant to know. So if he'd left with them, you'd have known why he changed his mind. If I'd have left with him, we'd both be dead, so... I don't know why I bother thinking about it. I found my own way in the end, and it wasn't my brother's, and it wasn't my god's. I don't know if it was right. But I couldn't abide what Widewin was doing to his own. God or not, I don't regret it. Whether Widewin was Aeothus, well, it hardly seems to matter after what we just heard. 
And all these questions I've been trying to figure out. I think I just miss my brother. Let's be on our way. Still one more mess we gotta straighten out. Come on then. I still owe you one. What a bro. Alright, Aloth. We've been lied to. Our whole lives. And many lives before that. And it's led us to put our faith in a pantheon of gods that never deserved it in the first place. Theos is wrong. Most people are fundamentally decent. Knowing the truth can only make them better. You're right. People will be better off finding direction on their own than following this farce. Besides, the gods haven't exactly done much to prevent us from slaughtering each other. If anything, they've only given us more pretenses for doing so. Seems like that's all they've been doing of late. I've also been thinking... There won't be much left of Theos by the time you're done with him, if I know how you operate. <laughs> that will leave the leaden key headless. Perhaps it's best it stays that way. I agree. Then let's face Theos. When this is all over, I'll make sure that no one is able to commit his abuses again. Alright, save it. Oop, wait. I need the rest of you. Anyone here in Echo? Very dark down here. Full of surprises, aren't you? Look at the size of this place. We light our own path now, Watcher. Can you do that again? I, I had something in my eye. I missed most of it. I'm gonna leave myself in fast mode, so I'm moving a little bit quicker here. The hell are you, Inguithin Shade Spirit? Gun. In fact, gonna worry about looting at this point. Oh, there's a dragon. Chained and looked like it was tortured or something. How did you get over there? Yeah. Oh. Shadow tree. Yes. All right, Scotty, we gotta make this quick. I'm assuming none of these things are dropping right, anything that's particularly useful. Chalky bits of bone break away between your fingers. <clears throat> Shadows in the cavern suddenly lengthen and swallow you. When your eyes adjust to the darkness, you find yourself in the midst of what must be another vision. You are surrounded by mist. The ground feels springy under your feet. You imagine that as soon as you take a step, the soil behind you will erase all trace of your, pa of your passage. As if on cue, the mist before you clear just enough for you to take a couple steps forward. You do, and the fog closes behind you. You continue for a few minutes in this manner, one step at a time, never seeing more than the ground right in front of you. Eventually, rays of light cut through the haze. You find yourself facing a canyon wall. Durance's head twitches as though a mosquito had flown into his ear. He swings haphazardly at the air of his staff. Something whizzes past you. Just as you turn, you catch another whir of movement. Out of the mist flits a shape, small and round. <clears throat> you think you see another, and another. They tickle the corners of your vision. 
You turn back to the canyon wall. The sun shifts along its path and what looks like a smooth rock face is the hollow of a cave. The figure steps out, his features shifting and changing before your eyes. The figure transforms from male to female, from Orland to Amawa, its bones lengthening and its fur receding into his flesh. The only detail that remains consistent is the smooth eyeless face. The whizzing, rushing shapes from the mist converge on the figure and they form a, as they form a spinning cloud, you realize that they are eyes. You understand the value of a mystery watcher. A buried scroll, a hidden truth. These are my ways. You unravel a thread watcher. One you have lost and discovered over generations. And following it to its end has only brought you back to the beginning. What are you talking about? Whale giggles, a strangely modulated sound that rises and falls as the god shifts from one form to the next. You seek and search while your foe obscures, and even your quest for answers to their past has only led you to another mystery, or one grander still. I'm here to stop Wodica from tipping the balance of power, which means you must scatter the very things she seeks. A nebula of souls, blind and brimming with potential. The answer to Wodica's question at the beginning of yours. What would you do with them? Thunder clouds form overhead, casting shadows of movement across the canyon. <clears throat> According to Hylia, it's possible to restore him to the Hollowborn. A song the world knows and tires of. The droning chorus repeated again and again. Better the improvised melody, the unfolding chant. The listeners sit rapt, and just when they think they have the tune, it changes again. Whale folds Even his hand. Even the gods oh. require fresh mysteries. Well, excuse me. Clouds break and a torrent of rain washes Whale's features clean. His blank face molds itself again, taking on a shape of something you've never seen before. Do not consign the souls to the fate of some god's choosing. You have found them, now scatter them across existence. <clears throat> I'm totally starting to lose my voice. The destination known to neither god nor, modal, nor, nor mortal. Let them be lost again. New answers to new riddles. Behind him, the sudden downpour has carved new caves into the canyon. What end would that serve? No end, Watcher. That is the purpose. But what would happen to the souls? None know. They could end up anywhere in the realms of gods or mortals, whole or divided. Discovering them again and charting their course through the ether will be a new mystery. Farewell, Well. That is a word for endings, and this is but a crossroads. Even I do not know what you would choose. Well, aren't you just Mr. Mystery? All right, save it. Uh, I'm not gonna jump over yet. It's probably just a shortcut. And you're gonna throw another Drake at me somewhere. Maybe not. Maybe so. Man, he just came in out of nowhere. Durance buff. Itamok, get that. Very glad these enemies are very easy. Leads to a small treasure chest, okay. Ain't even gonna worry about it. Door is just behind you. Hold up, I'm gonna take a look down here. Oh, it's just enemies. Alright, let's go for the door. Oh, there it is. I thought it was that wall there for some reason, the way this place looks. You 
ready to take the oath. To spread the word of the gods to the lost of the heathen. I am trusting you to remain loyal to the gods in this. If you do not, you will have... I wouldn't ask this oh, I know, any other off. choice. This is a missionary, same as I was. Taught the wrong things as I was. Asionis. They have held off many would-be invaders. So close. You are ready to give a confession? <laughs> I'm ready to hear one from you. From you. Let's save it one more time. All right. Statue is warm to the touch. Oh, it's a giant one of those machines. I'll save a pause here, continuing on Monday. <laughs> I would be a real asshole if I stopped right now. As long as I've got enough time, I want to have I want to be done before my girlfriend comes home. You've come to a circular room, grand and domed, its walls lined with Adra and trimmed with copper. At the far end, a great pillar of Adra pierces the floor from below like a ragged spike, its shimmering texture giving the illusion of boundless death. Your thoughts are yours and not yours, and they are all questions. The base of the pillar stands Theos, a look of concern on his face as he notes your approach. We have something you want to ask him, one question above all others, spinning madly in your mind, but you don't dare ask it yet. You need some admission from him first, some hint of the veracity of your suspicions. You are far from your post, Inquisitor. What brings you here? Was Iovara telling the truth? That woman sought only to destroy the foundations of peace and civility that my people sacrificed everything to build. What is this place? We are in a sanctum holy to Udika. There are others like it in service to the other gods. I come here often to pray for her counsel, and in this space I may be assured that she hears me. That machine behind you, what does it do? It has many uses. But its purpose is to bring structure to the chaos that surrounds it. All these statues, who are they of? They are monuments to Woodica's greatest servants among my people. I hope to join them myself one day, but my work is not yet complete. Was the entire Inquisition based on a lie? The Inquisition was based on the need to cut the flesh from a rotting wound. You are shaking now, having lost all patience for tact. No more evasions. You have to know everything you believed, everything you have done for the gods. Did you lie to me when you said the gods could end suffering? Theos says nothing. Are there no gods? What is a god? What is a man? A higher power. A rewarder of good deeds and punisher of the wicked. Something men can turn to in their darkest moments when their days seem only like bridges from one tragedy to the next. Our gods are all these things. Are there no gods? With, no. We are in a sacred place within earshot of the gods themselves. This is not the time. You've been through much these past few months. You will return home and you will rest. When you feel you have recovered, you may rejoin us at the trials. The Inquisition is far from over, and I will have need of you. There are many who continue to spread the lies of the apostate. The Inquisition will not end until we have pronounced judgment on all of them. His eyes linger on you, and there is no mistaking the threat behind it, and your rage shrinks the image of an iron wheel in your mind, monolithic and caked with dry blood of thousands. You do not ask your question again. How did you find it? 
I should just attack. I didn't, it was Lady Webb. Another in a string of acts of petty defiance. For all her knowledge, she always preferred spite over reason. She loved you. Then she should have obeyed. I ask one thing of all my followers. She was incapable. A waste of rare talent and intellect. Blind obedience is a lot to ask of someone with a mind of their own. What of your cohorts, then? They have followed you to their deaths. Is it loyalty that brings them here? Or is it as my agent suggests, that they have no direction of their own? You. You worshipped Aethus, did you not? Your spies are good. What gave me away? The cape? Yet when your god needed you the most, you chose your country. We were being invaded. Not by anyone who was acting like a god. Then I should think your hometown gave you a hero's welcome when you returned. They made cake. <laughs> Hard to blame people for losing faith when it's the gods who are misbehaving. The gods argue over how best to prevent Kith society from destroying itself. These disruptions would not be necessary were mortal instinct not so diseased. Thurn stares at Theos with a beast snarl. Theos watches him calmly. You built a weapon that delivered exactly as promised. I served my goddess as you did yours. Yet the other builders were slain. Eleven of a dozen. Why not you? Were you somehow different? Redeemable in your god's sight? Whatever desire I had to be redeemed in her eyes was weakness, purged by the Watcher's sight. Or was it merely that your goddess wanted you dead as well, and your delusions of importance prevented you from seeing the obvious? A whore's beguiling charms, nothing more. But the spell's broke now, Theos. The trial's over. I know friend from foe. And I've come here now to see a foe repaid. You were able to destroy a god because another god wished it. Without her hand to guide you, you could not strike at a god any more than you could strike the sky. You are impotent, and not just from the pox. Ooh. I understand your duke's bells gave you a mission. Their orders do not absolve me of my greater responsibility to the safety and well-being of the republics. Might want to skip over this one, Theos. Don't want to pick a fight. You can't win. Yet you disobeyed. Something you already have a reputation for. They will know, of course. If it had been for a worthy cause, they might have forgiven you. But I don't see them pursuing animancy after seeing what it's done here. They trusted you. And you disappointed. As you always have. And you will again be disowned. The parents scold, but the children are safe. Whether animancy research continues in the Republics or not, they will survive. For now, that's enough. In any case, I wouldn't be so smug about my fate, Deus. I imagine Woodaka responds to disappointment much more severely than even my dukes. State your name and purpose, young acolyte. My name belonged to the gods and my hand to their service. No more. You serve none but yourself. Without contact with your order, you can have no higher purpose. Only the base concerns of the flesh. You have cast yourself from our ranks. And I should have done it years before. I'd rather live in uncertainty than servitude. And that uncertainty would lead you where it leads everyone. To doubt, to emptiness, to the many cruelties inspired by disbelief. You will have to forgive your Grandmaster for remaining skeptical of his Initiate's choices. You are far from home, Dwarf. I knew my hunt would send me a long way from Masuk. It was a challenge I was glad to undertake for my village. A journey, then. It must be of some import to take you so far and to last so long. Anything worth doing comes at great cost. So it was worth it, then, to tell a dying beast of things it neither understood nor had memory of. You are here because you are lost. The gods cannot reach everyone, I'm afraid. May you fare better in your next lives. I gather you have had your soul awakened. Why else would you shadow my footsteps like some stray <clears throat> mongrel? You think I have something to offer you, but our business was concluded long ago. What do you know of our business? You think your abilities only flow in one direction. That isn't how it works, I'm afraid. Not for me. For all that you saw of my soul in the sanitarium, I saw as much of yours.
I lived my life by the lies you told you owe me the truth. I answered your questions once. That your soul is not fit to accept the answers is of little concern to me. I lied to no one. Not to you, not to anyone. The gods are real. They are everything we need them to be, and the world is better for it. You denied a generation its place in the world. The heart of this country has skipped a beat. <clears throat> Nothing more. I have done far worse. I plunged the peaceful kingdom of Telosus into civil war. I slew the monarch of Desantio, whose people never knew hardship under his rule, and replaced him with a cruel despot who brought them to ruin. When plague arrived at the great city of Arborensis, I saw to it that the cure did not. They piled their dead outside the city in heaps that rose above their walls. Nothing could justify these atrocities. That's where you are mistaken. There was a time, back when your soul was still a shapeless mist, when the world believed only in false gods. Thousands of them. Gods that told them to take slaves. Gods that told them to make war upon their neighbors and devour the slain. Gods that told them to burn their children alive and cover themselves in the ashes as a sign of their faith. But all that changed when they learned of the true gods. Our gods. All those misshapen, bestial instincts melted beneath the radiance of our gods majesty. You could see it in their eyes. That dull emptiness replaced with the glimmer of a kindled spark. A spark of false hope. There is no false hope. Only hope for things that never come. Have you imagined this existence? The one the apostate would have created? We are not all so virtuous as she. Without our gods, the most wicked, the most tyrannical, they would take that power for themselves. But more than that, it would be a hollow existence. All mysteries forever unanswered. All purposes constructed from meaninglessness. No endings to bring closure. Only a wheel turning without mercy, grinding our spirits to dust. Better than to live a lie. Telling yourself each day that what you do matters, that it isn't all for nothing, that the world is just. The apostate's world is built on believing lies. All I have seen, the millennia of experience, I will not be dissuaded from this course. This is the only way. At least admit it. Admit to me that the gods are not your gods. I need to hear from you. You have not thought this through. There is no leaving this place for you. I allowed it once, but you have made it all too clear what a mistake my mercy was. Uh. I don't know why he suddenly got real quiet. Hear me, Woodica. Your servant calls for aid. All right, asshole, time to die. Rock ten. Oh, no, not Minotaurs. All right, uh, buff. Liquid, what are these things? Vessels, liquid, sword, go, over here. Aloth, oh god, I gotta remember what the heck I usually do with you. Pelagina, tie up with this guy. Let's see what you can do here. Piercing Sigil. As characters getting that hit you. Freezing Rake. Target. That looks nice. You're already stunned. Oh, wait a minute. Is this it, everybody? Wait a minute. That's not going to stick around, is it? Wait, 
what just happened. Is he... Did he teleport? I don't even know what's happening. <laughs> Except he just confused everybody. Uh, you can do something about that. Back to killing this man. Alright, let's not play with him anymore. Sworn Enemy, Heart of Fury, Sagani, don't be them. Marked, Takedown, let's just hit him with everything at once. That worked out nicely. At your feet rests the body of Theos, hollow, the dense wrinkle shaped by the silent sh shouldering of a internal burden now smoothed across his color-drained face. His soul remains still for the moment, defenseless, his energy expended in defeat. He lies sprawled across his body like a death shroud. That's the servant down, and the mistress still to go. A good start, worthy of being built upon. After journeying for lifetimes, I can't imagine his failure. Knowing it was all for nothing. In his own way, Theos must have truly believed he was caring for the people of Aeora, protecting them from themselves. A shame his soul won't have a chance to reflect on his errors before it enters the wheel. Some point, you have to look at the things your god is telling you to do. And ask yourself if it's worth it. He spent his lives, more than any of us will ever know. For what? Binding the world to a lie. Could a man like that ever be redeemed? Explore his soul. With a deep breath, you plunge into Theos' soul, where in Brackenberry it had been a maze of narrow corridors and dead ends. Now it is expansive and borderless, its walls crumbling into heaps like the ruins of Ingwith as you pass through them. You travel for what seems like ages, rushing to a known destination, a memory you glimpsed once before. At last you see it, no more than a pinprick of light at the end of a, dark, of a long tunnel, expanding slowly at first and quickly as you near. You come out in a room you're standing in now, but it is new and pristine and filled with people. Thousands of them, all turned towards the great Audra pillar and the machine that encases it. Theo stands at the machine, and you are one with him now. You look out at the crowd, at the faces of shriveled old men and cherub-cheeked little girls, at mothers bouncing infants to quiet them, and fathers clasping their children's restless hands. Phew, and watching you with somber acceptance, a woman with tears in her eyes gives you a small nod. You turn back towards the machine, your breast constricted beneath the weight of unwanted knowledge, preparing yourself to set out alone on a journey without end. You close your eyes and open them again to find the machine still in front of you, beckoning. You take your place in front of it and place your hands upon a large mechanical disc at the base of the great crystal column and speak a single word. Giant rings creak to life, building speed, setting arrays of carved draconic mouths aglow and sending tremors to the platform beneath you. The entire room shakes now at the force of the accelerating machine, all sound drowned out by its deep, deafening thrum. Brilliant tendrils of light arc outward from the pillar in all directions, and you look over your shoulder to see them engulfing the crowd, burning them brightly like hot iron. One by one, the tendrils disappear, leaving ashen effigies where people once stood, many of them disintegrating into gray heaps under the stress of the tremors. You look above to the Audra pillar, and a glowing spherical mass has begun to coalesce atop the column where the arcs converge. It grows and pulses, translucent and bulbous like some immense uh, chrysalis, suspended in slow rotation as though it were being spun from the arcs of light. When the last arc disappears, the spectral mass hangs a moment, no longer rotating so bright you must shield your eyes with your outstretched hands, and it seems as though you, it is looking at you. You bow your head in acknowledgement and look back up to see it melt into a pillar. Like warm candle wax, the pillar flares with a flash of light bright as the sun itself then fades to darkness. The machine slows down to an abrupt halt, and when the last echo of its grinding cogs has passed, the chamber is still and you are alone. 
From all sides, reality begins to bleed in through the memory, and you find yourself in your own skin once more, looking down at Theos' lifeless body. <clears throat> you sense a listlessness to Theos' soul, an overwhelming fatigue that hinders this immediate escape and makes it vulnerable to manipulation. You feel as though your victory has given you some kind of hold over it, and you're able to do with it as you please. Is there anything I should do here, Tenwin? I kind of like number one. It's up to you. I'm going to return to the cycle. You will remember this, Seos. Remember that no man can hide the truth forever and all you've done was done in futility. Your memory shall be your penance. To apply the teachings of Durance would more immediately satisfy the cravings in my bones. But this is the stronger lesson. For his soul is already marked by his own hand. Some acts cannot be forgiven, it seems. I suppose we'll see if he can rise above that. You can feel the pull of the intricate Adric capillaries that rise up from the dust below the chamber. Many are bound up with the Great Pillar and with Passawadika. Some are filled with the souls of the dead, bound for somewhere else entirely, and you know these are past for birth. Stretching your presence as far as your spirit will allow, you make contact with one such path, and between it and yourself, you open up what feels like a long tunnel, sheer and undulating like the gull of some enormous beast. You shift your focus to Theos' soul, clinging weakly to his vanquished shell, and with all your concentration, you wrench it free and send it hurtling through the channel until it passes into the age of vein and can be felt no more. In the stillness that follows, a single word echoes through your mind, a word you spoke when you were one with Theos in an ancient memory. You realize it is a word that activates the machine. Hold up a sec. Okay. Alright, so I guess I gotta go back up to the machine. Actually, I gotta stop here, everybody. I'm kidding, I hope I have enough time for this. As you approach the machine, the path underfoot suddenly changes to a cobbled road. If you hadn't experienced visions like this already in Tier Everon, you'd be tempted to believe that the machine has sucked you into it and deposited you in the middle of nowhere. Some blazes overhead in the rolling meadows and thick forests on either side of the road could be anywhere in the deerwood. A shrill cackle turns your head. Standing next to you is a malnourished man clad in a threadbare loincloth and manacles. His entire body is stripped of lash marks and there are scarred pits where his nose and ears should be. He stinks of stale sweat and unwashed filth. You notice someone wandering on the robe to figure his back is to you. The scarred slave has your attention for now. You know something of quiet servitude, watcher. Groveling and simpering before the gods whose aid you need, so that when they finally raise you to a place of power, you can seize what you desire. You have labored at the pleasure of others. That shriveled hag in Hadrat House, those preening soldiers with more taste for silk than steel, the wretched tribesmen playing out their fantasies of grandeur. And then you cowered and knelt before the gods themselves, begging one paltry favor and receiving riddles and visions in response. And now the gods give you orders and commands, even while you set out to fix what they cannot. Yet what have they offered you? They offered us the means to stop Wudica and Theos, that's enough for me. A suspicious grimace crosses Alos' face. I get the feeling this is his way of giving you new orders on behalf of his own master. Be careful, Liquid. Given the breath of the Iron Manacle, it's amazing he can raise his bone thin arm, but he does, and he points at the person point walking the other way along the road. The exiled queen is not an ungrateful patron. You get a better look at the lone figure and realize that she's wearing robes, tattered and singed, but fine other, nonetheless. On her head is the silhouette of a broken crown. She continues walking, her pace slow but determined. Finish the work Theos began. Strengthen Woodica with these souls and allow her to become the most powerful of all the gods. With you as her favored. I've been working against Woodica this whole time. Why would she thank me now after I've defeated her most loyal servant, you nut? 
The ragged hole in Skane's face wrinkles with disgust. Loyal and weak, Theos proved his inadequacy when he failed to anticipate you. A plan exposed is worse than none at all. But you have proven resourceful, equal to the schemes of gods. Wodica has a long memory. Watch her for both friends and foes as she keeps her, her oaths. Uh, helping Wodica would mean that the secrets of the gods stay hidden. He rubs his hands together as black eyes gleaming. Safely hidden, yes. From the vinyl overlords who would cease to, fa to fear punishment in the next life. From the heavy-handed masters who would answer to no one. The world needs some schemes or other souls to kiss so purity would snap the tenuous threads of bind society. Ala snarls and Theos makes a better overlord. This one is the god of slaves. What would he have left if the world were unchained from his mistress's eyes? What do you mean by her favorite? Uh, the recipient of Rudika's blessing, she all, had always had a place for mortals of particular merit. If you help her now, she will become the most powerful of all the gods, and you will be the one who made her so. Think of the lifetime's reward you would reap. The only reward I wish is joy of pulling bloody shards of her broken crown from my staff where I have finished with her trial. Huh. Skane turns his flinty eyes on Durance. So says your companion who has been abandoned by his own god. Do you really trust him to make alliances for you? Skane takes a bundle at his feet and hefts the bundle onto his back. I've explained the alternative. Watcher continue as a pawn of the gods or a partner of one. At the other end of the road, the figure stops. She turns her head just enough to look over your shoulder. Her face mostly hidden, but one merciless eye pierces you from a cheek of ripped, scorched flesh. I won't help you. You say that now, but when you're standing in front of the machine, considering the lifetimes and the powers that await you, we'll see what you do. He continues down the road, and when the sun suddenly drops below the horizon, it plunges you into momentary darkness. You come to your senses in front of the machine. All these evils we've seen going all the way to Saints War, that was Wodica. Imagine if she was stronger on top of it all. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We're already hey. serving uh, Halea. With your companions bearing witness, you step up to the machine where Theos once stood before his people long ago. The great machine lies in front of you out already. You've seen this machine and others like it in operation. You understand how it works as a device for directing souls. As a watcher, it would be a simple matter to influence this direction, as though as big as the machine is, it may be the last thing you ever do. Speak to command, activate the machine. I'm really glad I took speed reading in high school. There is a shrieking of stone grinding against stone as old cogs loosen and begin to turn. You have only moments before the souls will be sent into the Audra vein. This will be your only chance at redirecting them. Uh... Return the souls to the bodies they were intended for was what Hylia wanted. I am right, right? <laughs> so I want to get this right the first time. <laughs> All right. You close your eyes and expend your perception outward, taking it in the immense uh, totality of the tens of thousands of souls orbiting the chamber. Your grasp on the souls is tenuous. You find yourself fighting to keep them all within your influence. You can feel them slipping away from you as the machine gains speed. A brief moment comes when it feels as though you hold them all at once and their force is so great it feels as though they will tear you apart. In that moment, you dedicate your entire being to bending their orbit, channeling their flow in a new direction. At your command, the ancient device became your instrument spinning to life with deafening resonance and gathering up the swirling essence like thread on a great spindle. There, in the pale pulsing glow of the machine that set you on this path long ago, you summoned all your strength, focusing on your objective and blocking out all else. With a single concussive blast that rocked the chamber and sent you tumbling to the ground, you freed the souls from their stasis. Exhausted, your consciousness slipping away. Your last sight was of the machine, dark and dormant. Then your eyes closed, and sleep welcomed you at long last. After coming to and searching for some time, you discovered the route Theos used to enter Sun in Shadow, and embarked on a long and arduous ascent back to the surface. You emerged in Terror Evron after days of tunneling through the rubble Theos had left behind. And when you stepped into the daylight, you were faced with a different deer wood than the one you had left. At your direction, the souls diverted by Theos were guided back to the vessels originally meant for them. For the first time, parents of hollow-born children woke to the cries of their infants and looked into their eyes to see them staring back. People fell to their knees where they stood, thanking Helia or Magrin or even Aethus for their forgiveness of whatever guilt they felt they bore. 
But for all the relief that had come to some parents, others only found new grief. For many thousands of Hollowborn had died during Widewind's legacy, many by their parents' own hands. For those children, there would be no homecoming. Yet the last hollow birth was in the past now, and those parents willing to risk trying for a new child were frequently rewarded, often with twins. Many felt they saw Helia's hand in it, and the year would be remembered as the year of Helia's splendor. Lord Radric's zeal had brought him back to life once, but it would not do so again. Radric's destruction at your hands spelled the end of his suffocating rule over Gilded Vale and the surrounding area. In his absence, the village prospered, becoming a popular destination for new settlers anxious to leave Defiance Bay after the riots. Without a nearby ruler, it also grew more wild, with many settlers moving on as soon as they'd arrived, turned off by lawlessness that was excessive even by Deerwarden standards. Nevertheless, despite the challenges of living there, Gilded Vale had survived, and would continue to survive for the foreseeable future. Following the assassinations of Duke Avar Wolfgren and Lady Webb, Defiance Bay was thrown into political upheaval. In the ensuing weeks, the streets had become the domain of looters and blackguards. Few dared to step outside their own doors alone or unarmed. But order was soon re-established by the Knights of the Crucible, who, despite their depleted numbers, had gained favor in the public eye for their role in the unraveling of the conspiracy surrounding Widewind's legacy, and were quickly reinforced by returning forces from Fleetbreaker Castle. For the Knights, their resurgence marked a return to the tradition as well. Having seen firsthand the dangers presented by dabblers and animancy, the Order quickly abolished the practice internally, preferring the familiarity of their hammers and forges to the uncertainties of Essence and Adra. Their identity rediscovered, the Knights suppressed their political aspirations and began once again to train their recruits in the art of blacksmithing, recapturing the post-revolutionary ideals of Deerwood and regaining the respect of its citizens as a result. The destruction of the machine atop Ter Noaneth spelled the end of the reanimated corpses in Heritage Hill. Though at first few were willing to venture into the abandoned district, it was soon cleaned out and rebuilt. The district's horrors still fresh in people's minds, it would be some time before it was fully repopulated. But eventually, the lure of cheap prime land would all but erase the memory. As it often does. The Duke's assassination at the apparent hands of an Animancer had caused catastrophic rioting in the streets of Defiance Bay, and few Animancers survived the first day. Many Deerwoodens took the end of Widewind's legacy as a sign, both that the gods did not approve of Animancy, and that the purging of Animancers in Defiance Bay had been enough to satisfy them. In time, their rage would subside, and a number of surviving Animancers remained in and around Defiance Bay, often taking to the wilds to practice their science without repercussions. The town of Deerford had seen the last of the Cult of Scan. Dark rumors about the town's many curses quickly faded, and travelers soon returned. Abidun's renewal brought new vigor and purpose to a god long known for quiet, steady labor. Handicraft saw a revival in the Deerwood, and no smith wanted for an apprentice. Additionally, Abidun's restored interest in preservation led to redoubled efforts to survey Ingwithin ruins. Anamancers and craftsmen alike found much to study, but tensions with Er Glanfoth rose. As for Stalwart, the Battle of Caron's Scar only strengthened their resolve to unlock the mysteries of Durgan Steel and build new marvels with the White Forge. However, Stalwart's ambitions brought them into further conflict with the Raid Serens, as more and more impoverished communities gathered at the border and vowed to finish the work of the Iron Flail. It would be many generations before the region saw peace. The Flames that Whisper Clan found a cautious peace with Stalwart, particularly once the villagers heard of the aid the ogres had offered against the Eyeless. The clan moved back into the russet wood, and as Stalwart grew in prestige, the villagers formed a tighter alliance with their ogre neighbors. Within a generation, 
ogre traders visited Stalwart, and village hunters were welcome in the russet wood. Harmka's death had brought the Devil of Carrick little satisfaction. In time, her taste for vengeance soured. What replaced it was a hunger to feel something, anything, new. Summer had thinned the snowpack twice over when she felt the joint at her elbow first begin to stiffen. She turned her back on the hopes of animancy and civilization and walked east. Oh damn, her body was breaking she down. She pushed through the mountains, past Raid Ceres, and into the broad plains of Isha Middle. She had forgotten what it was like to simply journey, no goal or destination in mind. Though she felt nothing more than the steady thump of her feet on the road, the endless horizons and grassy meadows were new to her. She measured her time in the gradual rusting of her body and was satisfied. Her movements slowed, but so did the world around her. Waist-high grasses undulated and tacked in the wind, as gradual as the tides. Sparrows and black jays made steady pilgrimages across the sky, each flap of their wings a solemn salute. She could hardly move when she found something she had never seen before, the ocean. With the last of her strength, she pulled herself beneath the water, content at last to feel the movement of currents and the constant caress of the waves. Zawa came to understand that the time of the Takan had passed. With his soul no longer fettered to worldly concerns, he grew to become the enlightened Anitle his shaman had foreseen. He took up in an empty monastery near Cold Flow Lake, and word began to spread of his presence there. He taught pilgrims and students how to leave behind their vanity, their fear, and even their past. He invited those who studied with him to share their newfound knowledge, so that all might free themselves from suffering. Free from the burden of her memory, Maneha soon left the gift bearers and resumed adventuring. Now that she had a taste for the world, she wanted to experience it anew. Maneha rediscovered her zest for battle, extravagance, and romance. She kept her gaze on the horizon, looking from one journey to another more distant, from the lover in her arms to another more fervent. Hers was a life of excitement, violence, and passion. She moved too quickly for regret to catch up with her and she hoped only that she might outpace it in the next life as well. The fortress of Cad Nua emerged as a bastion of security in the midst of an untamed land, becoming the envy of every thane and earl in Deerwood. Legend grew over time of its impregnability, and stories of formidable invaders easily scattered by the Keep's defenses became popular around the hearths of Deerwood and Inns. Likewise, it also became a beacon to travelers, merchants, and visiting dignitaries alike. Reputed as the finest fortress in all Deerwood, people would journey from near and distant lands alike to experience its fabled hospitality and grandeur. Yeah, it seemed like she ended up After happy. the death of the master below, a strange quiet fell over the endless paths of Ad Nua. The attacks on the fortress above ceased, Ad Nua's silent titan the closest remaining thing to a master in its musty, forgotten passages. Pelagina had gone against the Duke Spell's orders by inventing a new trade arrangement with the Anamenfath to accommodate the recovering Deerwood and Market. With the Deerwood's people still weakened by Widewind's legacy, the Valian Republics easily pushed their would-be competitors out of the market. For her outrageous insubordination and audacity, Pelagina was banished from the Republics. She traveled north in the Eastern Reach, avoiding Valian ports and entering the ranks of the kind wayfarers. Despite her bravery and dedication to those in her care, her strange appearance made her feel like an outsider wherever she went. With your business concluded, Heravius quietly took his leave and headed home to Thane Bog. The elders of the Fisher Crane had not warmed to Heravius in his absence, and when he arrived, he was denounced and scorned. Horavius spoke of his deeds and of his communion with Galloway, yet none would support his petition to return to the tribe. One by one, starting with the oldest, Horavius challenged each member of the council to single combat, humiliating the Riau in a series of savage duels. With half the council bloodied and shamed, 
the elders at last acknowledged Taravius's strength, announcing him a hunter of the Fisher Crane tribe. Upon being granted this title, Horavius calmly left the village and embarked again on his life of wandering. Adair chose not to return home to Gilded Vale. Still most comfortable far from cities, he settled in Deerford, which, like many towns in the Deerwood, was beginning the slow process of rebuilding. Believing now that it was the obligation of Kith to be the leaders their gods had not, Adair was soon named mayor of the town, and under his guidance, Deerford soon began to prosper. He expelled the last of the Scanites from the area and drew new settlers with the offer of land, a trick he had learned from someone he otherwise preferred to forget. With each passing day, Deerford would come to more closely resemble the gilded veil of Adair's childhood, the one worthy of its name. Go Adair. When the dust settled in sun and shadow, Aloth looked upon the remains of Theos Ixarchanon, his former master. He saw where the Grand Master had gone wrong and what would be required to undo the harm Theos had wrought. With a flick of his wrist, he burned Theos's robe, headdress, and every other symbol of the man's power. Never again, he vowed, should Kith live in fear and blind obedience to an authority they did not understand. Armed with the knowledge and courage he had gained on his journeys with the Watcher, he set out on the long and lonely task of dismantling the Leaden Key. With both their aims fulfilled, Kanarua bid the Watcher farewell and sailed back to his beloved Rawatai. There, he reported on his findings to the Lore College. Kana spoke of the Ingwithan people, describing both their vile experiments and their inspiring accomplishments. He spoke too of the destruction of the tablet by the Leaden Key and the group's efforts to erase the Ingwithan legacy from the world. Both inspiration and cautionary tales, he said, could be found in the world beyond Rawatai's borders. Kana urged his people to continue to pursue knowledge abroad so that the lessons found there might benefit Tekoa. Kana's inability to prove his theory of Ingwithan influence diminished his academic standing, but his passion drew much interest from those less concerned with degrees. Kana swiftly became an influential figure in the move toward a more collaborative approach to expansion on the northern continent. In his personal life, he came to enjoy the reputation of an affable eccentric, willing to share grand and impossible secrets along with a drink and a song. With Theos defeated and the souls released from sun and shadow, healthy children were born once again in the Deerwood. The grieving mother sought a place where she might do penance for the birthing bell. She returned to Deerford where, to the astonishment of the villagers, she delivered the first healthy child in over a decade. She remained there and with each new birth, she saw a measure of hope restored to the Deerwood and a measure of grace for her own troubled past. Durance used Magrin's strength only until Theos had been cast from the world and then swore off her influence entirely. Regret came to weigh heavily on his mind and a man who had never previously lacked for words or opinions came to embrace silence and contemplation. He continued to wander, penniless and destitute, searching now not for the reason for his goddess's silence, but for a mechanism for revenge. The charred robes he continued to wear as a reminder that he had been burned by his goddess, and not just by the flames of the godhammer. Hope he washed them. Sagani experienced the four months of her journey back to Masuk in vivid colors. She strove to memorize every moment of her final trip through the Deerwood. Air Glonfoth, the Valian Republics, and beyond, preparing to tell her village of what she had seen on her long journey. All of Masuk shared in her triumph, and she felt her pride and elation magnified by the joy of her village. Never again did she doubt the value of her sacrifices. After decades as a long hunter, Sagani finally became one of Masuk's most respected elders. She guided her community with wise counsel and a generation after she finally passed, another huntress journeyed into the world to find her soul. For you, the death of Theos brought an end to your waking visions and a silence to the whispers of the past. In their absence, you were able to sleep. 
the questions of a distant lifetime ceased to trouble your soul. All that remained was what to make of the answer. But at the moment, there was little to be done, and the matter would have to wait. A long journey loomed ahead, made no easier by your decision to bring an infant to Sun and Shadow. Ha. Uh, baby. All right, is this the credits? We're gonna speed this up a bit. Whew. So is there more to this or was that it? Like, is it pretty much just the credits now? Or is there like an after scene or something? Sorry I had to rush through that so much, but uh, I'm like just getting done in just the amount of time because my girlfriend comes home, my dogs are going to start flipping shit and I'm probably going to disappear for like 20 minutes if I had to keep going. So, whew. Yeah, that was a ride. <laughs> that was really, 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 really good. And now it's done. Uh, I've mentioned it before during the stream, but I highly recommend this. For those of you who have asked, anybody is wondering, I highly, highly recommend this. It's very long. There's a lot to do in it. It can be very wordy. Which is fine. There's a lot of world building to do in it. It's a brand new world they're building up in it. And when I started off, I didn't quite know a lot about what the hell was going on because it has a lot of new stuff that is throwing at you, but stick with it and it all makes sense. And it had a very good ending. Oh God, I, it was over a hundred. The reading it, reading everything slows it down. That's the thing. All that reading I did slowed everything down. <laughs> Made it take a lot longer than what it would have. But it was very good, and I think the best part was I actually had a couple really good moments at the end there. Killing the Atra Dragon, killing Console Hot in one turn was, uh, was nice. And it coming down the way it did. That was absolutely crazy how it came down to a deer just outlasting him barely. I love fights like that. I love when it comes down to the wire like that. Yeah, um, I am going to get Pillars 2 and have it up and running this weekend. And then Monday, we will start Pillars 2 at 8 o'clock. If anything weird happens and I can't be here, I'll make a tweet about it. But I 